you were making the point that we never miss. Mm -hmm. Well, do, do we? we? You know, it's a hypothesis. There's evidence. You know, what kind of thing? Say, for example, we did a segment on Ken Klippenstein and noted some of his tendencies towards self-aggrandizing, guru-esque language and kind of presentation that, you know, he's going to feel corruption and whatnot. Then to see, would a sign of a potential concern be someone appearing on Steve Bannon's war room for a friendly chat. Oh. So that happened. And I listened to the segment because people were like, you don't know what he said on there. You, of course, I'm going to listen. And that's what do you think? Mm. Who do you think I am? My name's Chris Kavanaugh. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to so listen. So I listened to it. <laughs> and it is not a confrontational or in any way unfriendly chat. It's very much presented as, oh, you're a bit of an unusual character for our audience, but you're going to have lots of interesting things to say. I know the War Room Posse might not be familiar with you, but they're definitely familiar with your work. You were behind some really wonderful reporting that came to sort of the big tech collusion with the federal government, all kind of taking place at CISA, DHS, how they've been colluding to deprive us, not just of our First Amendment rights, but to really weaponize the federal government against people who dare to criticize uh, Joe Biden and, and his fellow apparatchiks. But you have a wonderful story that I've been wanting to get you on the show to discuss. I'm curious, you are someone who... Like I said, you don't come from the typical MAGA world, right, of guests that we we have on this show. So it's fun to have someone who, who I can ask these questions to. But from your perspective as someone who's probably a little closer to that kind of mainstream media, just just world, right, you understand, you sort of come from it. In your, in your opinion, do you think, you know, for example, right, we play montages on the show all the time of anchors and people on, you know, CNN, MSNBC. But it, what seems to be regurgitating the same exact phrasing, the same exact talking points, whether it's, you yeah. know, safe and effective or, oh, for democracy, right, these words that they don't they don't come out of nowhere Fr from your perspective sort of drilling down on what you were saying about how they're now getting these talking points these stories from whether it's think tanks or ngos the white house you name it do you think that that's a result of incompetence and these people just being you know lazy or is there something more not nefarious going on but is this trickling down you know i'm inclined to think about the story that you broke about the influence perception management office going up at the pentagon just a week after the ukraine invasion happened right is there some level, whether it's coming from the federal government or or whoever, that is sort of coordinating the messaging on these stories? What's your take on it? So I think the problem you're describing is particularly acute when it comes to national security, because the federal government uniquely has a stranglehold on the flow of information. Ken, we'll definitely have to have you back. I want to drill down into that Ukraine story, and I'd love to get your kind of vantage point on how the mainstream media is spinning all the uh, the Joe Biden debate aftermath, and I'm sure there's some unauthorized leaks going on there. But Ken, in the meantime, if people want to follow you, get your Substack, read it, um, support you, where can they go to do all that? The war room is just adjacent to Infowars in terms of conspiracy. So like, if you wonder why this is an issue, imagine someone going on Infowars and giving like a very friendly interview and you could point out, oh, but like uh, Noam Chomsky has been on with like Stefan Molyneux or, or has talked to Alex Jones or whatever. But if you listen to those interviews, he is not being like that. He is being Chomsky, right? Like he's, he's just sticking to his thing. And with Stefan Molyneux, he's lecturing them about how libertarians in America are actually reactionary right-wing people and whatnot. And so yeah. that's the difference, right? Ken Klippenstein going on the war room and talking about propaganda and these kind of things and yeah. indicting the war room would be a different thing yeah. and it would be a very different interview. That's right. So I'm just saying. That's right. And that's, that's why that chameleon-like behavior, that flexibility and being so accommodating to the context and changing, a bit like J.D. Vance has been accused of, mm. that is an excellent indicator of someone that is not someone to be trusted. And that's why Noam Chomsky, think what you like about his views yeah, and disagree with him as much as you like, but he is exactly as he presents himself. Yeah. And that's that's why I would never rate him highly on the Garoma. Yeah, I think he's like, you know, tailoring his message a little bit. That's what he's been accused of, Chomsky, at times and so on. But like, I think he is overall quite consistent in his point of view. And I'm yeah. very much like, this is his ideology. This is what he's going to say. And like, he will talk to various people with different ideologies, but he's always clear. So yeah, there, there just is a difference there. And um, yeah, and we'll see. Maybe Ken Klippenstein will not go further down 
that conspiratorial. Yeah. It's just a way. hypothesis. You just, you just, you just hypothesizing. I'm just hypothesizing, about but I'm control. just saying this would be <laughs> a mark in the column that the concerns yeah. might have been reasonably well founded. And why don't we leave it there?